So can 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 folks hear me now? Yes. No. Okay. okay. And uh, clear, clearly enough, uh, this this will work. Okay. Okay, I'll try. So yeah, if if um if, if you can't hear me or if you miss something, somebody put it on the chat and somebody there tell <laughs> me since I won't be able to keep okay, track of it. Okay, so um, we were talking about how to solve the, the linear time invariant equation. So we have, um, uh, we're, we're basically trying to solve this equation, x dot equals ax plus bu. Of course, since this is just an algebraic relationship, so once we know x of t, we can also figure out what y of t is. So really, it's the, the, the differential equation to solve is, is this one here. And in order to do this, we'll, we'll first change variables here, you'll see why in a moment, and we define a matrix exponential in terms of a, a, a Taylor series, taking advantage of the fact that a to the n is something that we can easily express. So um, it's r, d to the n, r inverse, where d's are um, uh, uh, lambda to the nth. And so this, um, I guess, should be more like an arrow. When, when we evaluate the exponential, all of the um, uh, terms will just gather into exponentials of the individual eigenvalues. So this will be e to the lambda 1t, e to the lambda 2t, all the way down to e to the lambda nt, our inverse. Okay, and so if we take a time derivative of z, we just stick in here and differentiate the first term and then the second term, but the second term is x dot, so we can put back in our ax plus b u. This term and this term cancel, and so we're just left with uh, th this term here. And so now we can just integrate this. And so Z integrates simply. And if we go back to our original variable X from here, then we have X is E to the AT times X of zero, the initial condition, plus a driving term that depends on the input U. Okay, so this is the, um, let's say formal solution of, uh, uh, the linear equation. So how does how does this work in something that you already know how to solve more simply? Um, if we take our harmonic oscillator here, our favorite example, then as we saw last time, the A matrix is, is 0, 1, minus 1, 0 when we convert to x, uh, 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 x1 is y, x2 is y dot. Um, and so we can take this A and diagonalize it. And so the result is here. And we had a good refresher yesterday on how to do this. And so now if we exponentiate this, then this will be e to the i t, e to the negative i t, and you have these matrices of eigenvalues here, and you put, put them all together, and lo and behold, you just get a rotation, which just says that the, uh, in, in the x1, x2 space, or uh, theta, theta dot, if you want to think of like a simple pendulum, it just rotates in, in space, which captures the solution that we, we, we know. Okay, so um, the, the, the nice thing about this, this, this form here um, is that this is, this is also very amenable to uh, uh, solving a system by uh, computer. So there are lots of routines that are very good at, at exponentiating matrices, which actually turned out to be a very uh, uh, non-trivial problem numerically, but it's something that mathematicians and numerical analysis, analysts have Work them for a long time, so you can go into MATLAB or whatever your favorite programming language is, and, and uh, uh, get solutions from these uh, uh, in in this form. And and, and in particular, um, symbolic programs like Mathematica and Maple also can do symbolic exponentiation, these kind of calculations, and so they use these routines internally. Okay, um, you might wonder, can we connect? The frequency domain and the time domain, the answer is yes. And I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, the, the, the basic idea is we can take these time domain equations, take the Laplace transform. So the time derivative turns into an S, it turns into multiplying by, by a complex variable S, and then uh, same, same for the Y. And so from, from, from the X equation, we can now isolate S times the identity matrix minus A, X equals B, U, and so then we can invert, assuming that it is invertible. And so if we can invert this, this matrix here, then we can express uh, uh, the transfer function. So this is, this is X and then Y will be uh, C, CX plus DU. And so we get an expression here that given matrices A, B, C, and D, you can construct a transfer function 
that, that goes from the input to the output. Um, notice that the, um, the poles of the transfer functions, this is what we were talking about last time, um, the places where the, va the, the values of S in the complex plane where, where uh, G is, is infinite are given precisely by the eigenvalues of A. And I'll just remind you that the eigenvalues of A, we would normally write like this, which we can rewrite as lambda I minus A V equals zero so that the determinant of this has to be equal to zero. And this gives a characteristic equation whose roots are precisely the, the eigenvalues. And so this is the same, you know, up, up to lambda versus S, this is the same uh, uh, condition here. And when this, when this vanishes, taking the inverse blows up. Okay, so um, it's, it's, it's really two uh, uh, identical, but, but rather different looking ways of looking at the same dynamics. So you're looking in the frequency domain, or in the time domain, but they're they're compatible. Okay, so if, if there are questions or if I go too fast, the slow me down or ask the questions and stuff. All right. So as I said, this 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 generalizes uh, uh, quite nicely to multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So in transfer functions, you would get a matrix of transfer functions, and you can you can deal with that. But um, uh, in the time domain. Um, we, we have the identical matrix A, but now B and C become matrices uh, uh, for inputs and outputs. And so it's, it's a very straightforward uh, formalism. I mean, essentially everything that I derive for one input, one output, um, if you just reinterpret B and C to be bigger matrices, we'll, we'll apply to multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Um, so uh, here I just go through the calculation for the harmonic oscillator um, for the transfer function. Um, uh, you can uh, I, I, you, you, you can go through this on your own, but it, it reproduces the going from the A B C D matrices that we had. You know, here's A, here's B, here's C, back to the transfer function that we we discussed. Um, and if you happen to observe both position and velocity, then C would just generalize into an identity, an identity matrix. Note that it's not this. Um, so so this C corresponds to observing separately the um, uh, position and the uh, velocity. W here's, a, here's a question for you. If C were equal to the row vector of one, one, what would that correspond to? Let's just see if this is thinking in. Do I couple, no, we, between a couple between uh, the position and velocity? Yeah, what, what do you mean by couple? I mean, because you have to multiply the, the C matrix by the, um, the vector of uh, outputs, no? Uh, states. no? Of, of Ys, no? No, uh, X. Ah, so so y, y is the states. output. So right. X is the states. Right. So, so the relationship is, is, um, is there's no data. Yeah, yeah, so the right, relationship right. is CX. You're right. OK. So the states. So I mean, you will have so a couple between the velocity and position, maybe. No? Yeah. So we would say that you're observable. You know, the, the, the variable the that you're observing is the sum of the position and the velocity. Yeah. OK. So that sounds a little bit weird. Um, but you know, you, you could design some sensor that did that, I suppose. But, but it's not what we mean by measuring separately the position and the velocity. That you would do by having two outputs. And so therefore, it's a. Uh, a, a two state vector to two output matrix. So it's a two by two matrix. Okay. So again, that's just the uh, sort of some of some of, some of the notation. Now, one thing to, to, to notice about um, the time domain is that there's a certain amount of abstraction, particularly in what we mean by the state vector. And one way to realize this is that we can do a coordinate transformation for these equations. So we can define um, an X prime, which is some transformation, mat transformation matrix T times X, so it change coordinates. And so we can stick this in. And when we do, we find that, that X prime obeys the same differential equation with transform matrices. So uh, A prime is just T A T inverse, B prime is T B, and C prime is C T inverse. Um, and so in those, with those new matrices, we have exactly the same form of the equations. Um, but notice, and it's maybe a little hard to see over here, that A and A prime 
share the same eigenvalues. Okay, so they, they will share the same transfer function. And so, you know, if we're dealing in the world of transfer functions, there's sort of only one transfer function between the input and the output. But if we work in the time domain, there is uh, um, uh, an infinite number of ways to represent the internal state that, that just depend on, on how you choose the coordinates. Um, so in fact, this artificial example could arise by somehow, you know, doing this change of, of coordinates, or you could, if you had something like that, you could also change coordinates to, to get rid of it. Um, but the main point is that this state vector isn't really a physical thing in the way that inputs and outputs are, because we can represent it in different coordinates and have different values. So you have to be a little bit careful in, in, in understanding what it means. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to this uh, uh, later on, but I just want to plant that, that idea. Okay, so um, in the time domain, some of the things that one might do are look at time domain responses to, to I mean, there, you could do it a general input, but there's some special inputs that, that, that are useful. Uh, one of them abstractly is just a delta function. So you, 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 you give the system a, a symbolic kick. So you is just some spike. And so if you uh, uh, look at um, uh, in, in the frequency domain, um, if we go from y equals g times u, so the convolution, so this is the, uh, uh, in the time domain, this would be y is g convoluted with u. So it's g convoluted with the delta function, but you remember the delta function when you convolute, it just returns back the original function. Um, and so you just get g of t. And so the time domain, so we've talked about g of s as a transfer function. And in the time domain, the function corresponding to it is just the green function. So it's the impulse response function. That, so, so sometimes it's an object that you all are familiar with because this is the usual thing that, that gets calculated in undergraduate physics courses and, and graduate and beyond. Um, in terms of the state space notation, um, what happens to the states? Well, we can just stick in delta of t uh, uh, into our integral that in the general formula that we found assuming zero initial conditions. And so this then just gives, uh, uh, we evaluate t prime is zero. So this just gives e to the at times, times b. So this would be the state uh, uh, impulse response function. Um, we can also look at things like uh, step functions experimentally. Those are easier to, to impose. So you take whatever your input is and just quickly step it up. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so for example, if, well, here I've, I'm plotting both impulse and step responses for a first order system for a second order system. So for a, uh, a first order system, if you, if you give it a spike, it will sort of the system will, will be displaced and then relax back. Um, if you give it a step, it will relax up to the step. If it's second order, then it can oscillate if it's under damped for these responses. And uh, uh, if it's over damped, then it again, just relaxes, but with two, two exponentials. So I won't go into that because this, again, this is sort of familiar territory, but just this is trying to connect what you already know to the slightly different way of looking at it. Okay. Um, so this gets me to, to one of the main topics that I wanted to broach today, which is uh, the notions of sort of complementary notions of controllability and observability. And in a way, these are technical things but they're actually much more than that. Um, but we'll, we'll start from the technical point of view. Um, the technical question is, you know, I, we've talked about systems um, and controlling systems, but it's useful to ask, is it possible to control the system? Not, not all systems are possible to control. And so before you try to control the system, you might want to check that you can control it. Um, similarly, the fact that we now distinguish between the internal state X, which is the slightly abstract n-dimensional vector, from the output Y, which might be just a single variable, could be multiple, but let's, let's think about the case where it's a single variable. So one of the questions is, does observing Y tell you what the state is? And 
even before doing any math, you can see this is important because you know the, the, the differential equation is f, f dot equals f of x. So if you know x, you know something about how it's going to change. But you don't know x, you just know y. Oh, sorry. Okay. So um, uh, we we observe y as a function of time, but what we would really like to know is x as a function of time. So so the questions that we'll ask are given an input u of t, which let's say at, at this point we're free to specify any any way that we want. Can you control all of the elements of x? Can you make x do what you want? And complementary, if you are given the observations y, you know, sort of starting in the past, do you know what x is now? Okay, and these are um, uh, th this is where we'll start. Okay, so let's let's think about a single input and a single output. So u and y are scalars, but remember x is an n-dimensional vector. Um, so um, there's a lot of jargon and people, there's a lot of sort of subtleties about what exactly do you mean by saying something is controllable. And in the literature, people make a lot of sort of fine distinctions and we won't be too, too picky uh, today, but roughly what I'll mean is that there's some U of T that makes a system start from an X certain state at time zero and end up in some other state at a finite time tau. Okay, and so the question is, is there some U that will take you from here to here? And we don't care in this point of view what the, what, what the path that's taken is. Sometimes you might, but right now we're just asking, I'm here now and I wanna go there at some time tau in the future. I get to specify tau, you get to specify U of T, is it, is it possible? And it might be or it might not. So we can think about the controllable set as the set of all the x of t that can be reached from x in some time tau. Um, we can also talk about a controllable system where you know, for any x naught, so any initial point x, I can get to any other, or you know, the set of all the points that I can get to in some time tau. Um, sometimes these are called reachability and people will distinguish between controllability and reachability and so forth. Um, uh, anyway, but this, this, this is the rough idea. Okay, so I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's best approached by thinking about a bunch of examples of systems that are or are not controllable. Okay, so um, let's look at the two-dimensional system, um, which is two first-order systems. So A is this diagonal matrix. So it's two um, uncoupled first-order dynamics. X1 dot is minus lambda one x plus u, and u is, is linked into the system by one zero, okay? So, you know, the, the, the two equations, when we write them out like this, so I've, I've sort of given it, you know, u is hooked up to system one and not hooked up to system two. So x1 dot is minus lambda one x1 plus u, x2 dot is just minus lambda two x2. So is it controllable or not? No, right? Because you know, if 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 there's a part of the system x two that is not coupled at all to u, there's no way that anything you do with u is going to change x two. Okay, but the state of the system is specified by the combination of x one and x two. So while you might be able to to drive x one to whatever you want at some time, you can't do anything with x two, and so it's not controlled. Okay, so we have this idea that the inputs should somehow you know have to have to hook up to uh, all of the state variables and this can either be done by having a u explicitly hooked up to each one or by having coupling internally okay um, by the way if we if we just focus on this guy here if we just had that x1 so it's just x dot equals minus lambda x plus u um, uh, it's it's in a way trivial to see that it's okay. Intuitively, it's it seems like it's controllable, but there's a, a trivial way to do it. So 
if, in, in, and in fact, you can do something even stronger, which generally you can't, which is to make it go on some path that you want. And how do I know this? Well, let's look at this equation here. X dot is minus lambda X plus U. And let's just reverse our thinking. So now imagine that you want the system to go through some X of T and you ask, what is the U? Well, the differential equation tells you, right? right. It's, it's plus, no? so plus the path on the X um, time for U. Yeah, so you just plug the path in here and that tells you what the U is, okay? Um, so when you can do this, this gives you a nice elegant solution. Um, I mean, in fact, in, in the statistical physics community, this was sort of rediscovered not too long ago. And I think uh, 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 it's, it's, it's your compatriots uh, plot. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, made, made use of this. I think they called it inverse engineering. But anyway, but it's a method that's been around. And um, uh, if, we, if we sort of think back on our A, you know, this is AX and the U, um, depending on the structure of A, uh, uh, and B, you might or might not be able to do this inverse. And you can apply this uh, uh, to nonlinear systems as well. And the gist of it is that there, there are classes of systems where you can do this inverse, and then it's a very nice way to design control. Um, and it tells you what's reasonable and not reasonable and so forth. Um, but not every system can be in that form. So, um, okay, so that's an aside. Let's get back to our system. Um, so here I have an input and it's, it's going to two copies of the same system. So it's, it's um, well, okay, it's, 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 it's like this third example here, except that lambda one and lambda two are equal. And I say it's not controllable. So why, why isn't it controllable? But is it not controllable? This is not controllable. Sorry, I'm talking about this one here. So this is the case, this is the oh. special case of three where the two lambdas are the same. Yeah. You can differentiate them, right? I'm sorry? You can differentiate. Can you, dip, you, can, you have the same input no matter what, right? Yeah, so so it's 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 the same input that's going to uh, e equally to uh, uh, both systems. Yes. Which are which are identical? Then, then if they, if, like, if you just need the other couples, yeah. Then you can have one system that runs them off, and then you can you can never differentiate the input to account for that. Does that make sense? Uh, so one, one it's not that it runs amok. It's that you have one input. You know, you have the same input going going to both systems. So. For example, if the initial conditions, you know, we haven't really specified what, what the initial conditions on them are, but let's say they're the same, then then the values will be identical, right? X1 and X2 will be identical for all times. But the point about controllability is that I have to be able to make it go to an arbitrary X1, X2 at some time. So I, I can't do that in such a system. And if the initial conditions were different, they might not be the same, but I don't have independent control. Okay, so so it's it's you know does the, my one variable u give you independent control of uh, 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 both x one and x two? Okay, so like if but if lambda one and lambda two are different, then you have control control of these. Okay, well no, so now now okay, so you're getting ahead of me. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. So so this is exactly this. This is going to be my question to you is now we, we talked about lambda one and lambda two being equal, okay? But now if they're different, so that's what I have here, is it controllable? So remember what this is asking. So the notice that the coupling here is identical, so it's one and one. So the input is getting coupled to these two independent systems. And the only thing that's different about them is that they have different time constants. They relax at different rates. And so my question to you is, can, if I want, for example, you know, let's say at time zero, uh, X1 and X2 are zero, and at time one, I want them both to equal one, let's say, can I design a U of T that makes that happen? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I can, I, I mean, if you, if you want to take five minutes and just try to play around with this, we can, this is a good point to take a break and, and give it a try just to, because I think in wrestling with these, you, you sort of understand what's going on. I'm sorry? Can you check for possible what is in the chat? Ah, Ooh, there's a lot in the chat. Sorry. Okay, that's just. <clears throat> I was told to make a full screen somehow. And yesterday was a larger user screen. It was a larger screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. It might be possible. I, I don't. Uh... Oh, you're in the upper right corner. Don't worry. On the top screen, there's a few options on the top. Just the center top. Yeah. This one? Yeah, and now full screen. Maybe first. Beautiful. Okay. Yes, it's a little bit bad on the right. Let me see. Maybe, maybe on top, the center, there is. Uh, it's just when, when yeah. it goes. Uh, it won't change because the uh, strain and the upper and the Okay. Okay. That's, that's as good as I can do. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so maybe take a, a, a minute and just play around with this and see if you can see uh, if this is possible, you know, if you get a sense of whether this is possible. Oh. Does anybody remember what the passcode of the meeting is? Or do you know what yeah, it is? Yeah. Four zero one. Three five. I'm sorry. Three five seven. Just walking off. Okay, that's it. Reporting in progress. And you put the conditions, so they have to be zero at zero. Um, oh, uh, sorry. Um, um, one. Just a second. So, so, uh, it, well, it doesn't really matter. Just they, 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 they have to be the same. They have to be in some initial condition and some final condition. I think I said zero, zero, and one, one. But it, I mean, controllability actually would require this for arbitrary x exit time zero and arbitrary exit time t. Okay, but. Just I'm, I'm just giving a specific example, but it can be whatever you want.
Uh, so there's a there's a there's a uh, comment in the chat saying from Leal, uh, I think it would be possible if we have a different set of numbers multiplying you, not one for both. So um, let's let's add that. Well, we're, the, here here the here the goal is to do it with uh, the same number, one and one for each. Uh, so. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll add this to the question because, uh, you know, in some sense, intuitively, it seems easier if those numbers are different, but, but I want the numbers to be the same in this case. Uh, So, so, so this isn't a, a, a particularly easy, you know, sort of as a, as a kind of calculus problem. Um, so we can, you know, I, I, I'll I'm not sure how long to let people play around. Um, we can, I mean, what I was hoping is you can get a feel for what what the issues are involved. Um, is it enough now, or do you want to you want a little more time? Or? What do you think? Continue. Okay. All right. Well, in the chat room. In the chat. Sorry. Okay. No, the path for lambda two x one minus lambda one x two is independent, so it's I'm not. Sorry, I was wrong. Sorry. Okay, so a, a, a withdrawn vote for no. Um, so, so what I was going to ask is, is if we had a vote, who wants to vote yes and who wants to vote no? Uh, so uh, let's 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 vote first for no. Okay, we've got one. Any anybody in the chat for no? No, no, not no. <laughs> Okay, yes. Three, okay, and 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 a number of undecided ones. Um, okay, so um, let me just see if I can unshare so I gotta wanna unshare my screen for a second. No, um, gosh, what did I just do? Ooh. Hello. Oh, the black um, no, but I want to um, set stop sharing. I don't want to leave, I just want to stop sharing the screen. Do I share the screen? Oh, 
probably talk about would stop sharing. Okay, I, I thought I pushed it. But... Okay, so let me let me share something else. I can hopefully. Um. Okay, so here, here, here here's the credit community that can use this. Yes, it's oh, too. Um, so I, so this is this I, I mentioned that there were some problems and solutions online and, and gave the links last time. So this is this is from one of those problems. Um, uh, I won't go through, I mean, I'll, I'll let you go through some of the details, but I wanted to focus on, on sort of a, a solution here, uh, which would give some intuition. So one of the things to realize is that you have a lot of freedom uh, with uh, uh, the function u. There's an infinite number of ways to choose a u of t. Um, it, it can help focus one's mind by taking a simpler form and just asking if that works. Of course, if it fails, that doesn't mean it's not controllable, but if it succeeds, it can make it easier. So in the problem, I think I suggest uh, trying step function with two parameters. So we let u of t go from negative u, it, it starts off at some negative value up to some time and then flips up to uh, a, a positive, you know, the opposite value plus u at some time not, and then continues up to time one. And, and in this case, a little past it. Okay. And so I, I've sketched, you know, can make it bigger here. So this is the, the input function. And of course, you have to choose the value of, of u naught a little less than four here, uh, and, and the value of tau a little a more than 0.5 here properly. Um, but I have two parameters. And so now you're asking, I give you a u with two parameters, and I have two conditions that at, at, at some time I want these equal. And so now you can ask just, can you solve that relationship? And, and it turns out you can. So what happens here? We see that they start out the same. Then with, with a negative u, um, they're, they're, they're diverging because they're relaxing at different rates. Okay, so, so um, with, with negative u, they're pulled down to the negative u solution. They're trying to relax, to it, but they're relaxing at different rates. And so now when you switch, they have different initial conditions and they relax up at different rates too. Okay, but these things are just such that they cross again at the time that you wanted to. Okay. And so I think you can see in that solution that it will even even with this simple parameterized form always be possible to to pull this off. Um, now notice that they're only equal at this one moment at every other time there's something else, but controllability isn't asking anything about the path in between or the path after it's just asking, you know, I was here at time zero. And I want to be here at time one. And can I do it? And this is a constructive answer to show that you can. You can iterate this process as many times as you want to, and make them cross as many times as you want. To. No. Yeah, but that's a uh, I, well. I mean, that's a separate question. Okay. So, so here I'm just saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to go from one point at one time to another point in state space at another time, and can I, can I do that? You know, asking, for example, whether I can hold it or make some path. That's that's a different question, yeah. Or, you know, more demanding question in some sense. Yeah. I mean, isn't the it right? Like, wasn't the question also that we could give x one and x two arbitrary values of the course, not necessarily the same? Yeah, at time, at, at, at some time. Right. Yeah. So so yeah. So if, if we had asked them to be, you know, two and one, you could still do this. Okay. Okay. I mean, once once you play with the math. For doing this one case, you'll see that it, it works for both cases. Um, but you want that x1 and x2 be equal at the same time, no? It's like also your two. Well, no, it's, 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 it's to, to arrive at the value x star. This is an example, but controllability sort of generalizes that statement that, that you can do this for arbitrary x1, x2, x2 uh, arbitrary x1. Yeah, yeah. X one, X two, X an arbitrary time. Okay, but again, if, if in this particular case, once you sort of 
you know, inject this parameterized form, you'll see that, yeah, you could, you could make it work for, for any combinations. Yeah. There's probably a number of solutions to that problem. There are, there are. That's right. So this is, I, I mean, this sort of special form is just something I pulled out of the air. Yeah. And so you could imagine doing this with other ones. And so that um, raises the, I mean, so, so, so the question that gets raised here, okay, uh, uh, has for so much in Java. All right, what's going on here? Let's, let's try to get this back. So this is maybe too ambitious um, on the Zoom chart. Okay, let's go to unification, share content, screen. Okay, are we back? No. Oh, yes, we are. Okay, good. Um, Okay, so we're back here. So, so um, we've gone through a, a fairly um, painful test to try to figure out, is this controllable? And so one of the first questions to ask or next questions to ask is, you know, is there an easier way to answer this question about whether it's controllable without having to be clever and go through a lot of calculus and, and you know, it's a... <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Uh, somebody, somebody sneezed uh, in the inter in the internet. So, um, okay, so um, so the answer, of course, I mean, I wouldn't be going through the setup if, if if there weren't a test. And so the answer is that I mean, there is a test. So let me give you the the recipe and then try to convince you that it it works. So the recipe is as follows: We're going to construct a matrix called the controllability matrix. And right now, remember, we have a single input and also single output, but here we only think about input. We have a single input. So B is a column vector, an n-dimensional column vector. A is a matrix. And so we form a, a, a matrix that has this funny form. The first column is B. The second column is AB. So remember, B is a vector. A, B is another vector. And so we make that the second vector. And then we take a squared b and all the way up to a to the n minus one b. And so this forms an n by n matrix here. And if the determinant is not zero, so if it's, if it's invertible, then the system defined by the matrices a and b, or the matrix a and vector b is controllable. So the first thing, okay, so this is, this is, this is the answer. And what I'll do is first, check that it makes some sense on the examples that we just did, and then try to see where it, com where it comes from. So just bear with me on the, uh, you know, why does this work? Okay, so we, we looked at an A that was lambda <coughs> lambda one minus lambda two, and B, uh, uh, oh, this is the first example, B was one zero. So A, B, we multiply this matrix on this vector and we get minus lambda one. So we put them together and we get one zero for B, and minus lambda one, zero for a, b. And we can see that this is not invertible and it's not controllable by this test. Okay, remember this was the one input, you know, two independent systems, the input only going to one of them. Okay, now we do example, should be two and three, I guess, that a is minus lambda one, minus lambda two, b was one, one, so identical. So now a, b is gonna be minus lambda one, minus lambda two, and so we form this vector here, or this matrix here. And so the determinant is lambda one minus lambda two. And so it's controllable unless the two lambdas are equal. Okay, so two lambdas are equal was example two and the ones that are not equal are, are, are example three. Okay, so this simple test, which as you can see, would be very easy to compute on a, on a, on a computer uh, 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 numerically, um, will tell you whether it's, it's, it's controllable or not without going through this painful set of uh, uh, thinking that we did. Painful, I should say, but useful because it kind of gives you a sense of what's, what's at stake in the question. Okay, so this, this, this is kind of the recipe. And so then the next question is, why does this work? 
Okay, so the first thing is um, we can always set the initial condition to be zero because we can uh, um, uh, we, we can just basically displace our coordinate so that that it, it's uh, starting at zero. Make it make a coordinate displacement. Okay, um, so uh, uh, just to remind you of something called the Cayley Hamilton theory, or sometimes the Hamilton Cayley theorem, that a matrix obeys uh, uh, an nth order uh, uh, characteristic equation. It's, it's nth order characteristic equation. So we remember when we defined eigenvalues, we had the characteristic equation for the for the lambdas. The matrix also obeys it. Intuitively, this is because it's just the matrix of all the lambdas uh, uh, in, in its diagonal form. And so um, if you, you know, it'll end up being n, n copies of the, the characteristic equation. If you write it as R D R inverse. Okay, so what is the consequence of that? It means that if we take a power A to the L, that it can be expressed as uh, a, an order N minus one polynomial. Right, because this is this is an nth order matrix equation. So it says that uh, um, I can express a to the n in terms of lower powers, and so I can always express any higher power in terms of these powers going from zero to n minus one. So what that means is that this matrix exponential e to the a t, which seems like it goes up to a to you know a to the infinite power, really only goes up to from from a to the zero to a to the n minus one. So you can express uh, uh, the, the, the matrix exponential as a linear combination of these powers. Okay. So now let's go back to the impulse response function that, that, that we talked about. So we have a U as a delta. Then is E to the A T times B, but E to the A is just this linear combination of, uh, uh, of, of powers from zero to N minus one. And so the, um, the x that results from a, from a delta function input is a linear combination, the coefficients that you would have to, 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 to work out and which could vary, which vary with time of these vectors, uh, uh, b, uh, a, b, a squared b, all the way up to a to the n minus one b. And so if this spans the whole space of xn, then you can get basically anywhere in that space. Okay, so the, the, the input, the delta function input is giving you uh, a, a response that, that, that spans the whole space. It's, it's reaching, you know, this one function input is generating time dependent vectors that reach the whole space. And so if you can do that, then, then essentially you can get anywhere. Um, any questions? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of just a sketch of the proof, but that's, that's basically why, why it's working. So there's a lot of comments I have on it uh, because because this this takes some unpacking to uh, uh, to appreciate. But um, any any questions up to now? And in the chat, to... sorry, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So uh, this is probably my uh, uh, misunderstanding, but. Uh, Suppose I discretize time just to make counting uh, better. Then mm -hmm. uh, given interval zero to capital T, I have U T, which I can just dissect into N interval. And then I have N independent U T elements, right? Yes. Then uh, this controllability means that I can get arbitrary Y1 and Y2. Each of entry has uh, not, not arbitrary time. Mean, X, the X, arbitrary X. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, so it's X, right. So the, the, I have two N entries, right? X1, there are N of them, and X2, there are N of them. Yes. So are we but saying not, that uh, I, we can get arbitrary two N entries out of N entries? No, no, we're saying at some particular time. So you're asking about, can I specify the whole, can one specify the whole path? And you're giving a good proof as to why you can't in general. Okay. Oh, I see. So we are asking only for the particular instance. Yeah. So, so you, you, you use n, but let's 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 call it uh, 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 some other letter uh, uh, m time steps. Okay. So m can be very very large, 
but at the at the end of the interval, you have to meet n conditions for the state vector. The state vector is n components, two two in this example, but n in general. But you can define you you have an infinite number of of you know or a, a large number an infinite number of, of intermediate uh, uh, inputs. So the u of t is infinite dimensional in some sense in, in the way you're describing it, or m dimensional, but m could go to infinity. But you're only asking for me to, so so it's massively um, uh, uh, underspecified in some sense. There 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 are, there are many many solutions. I think that yeah, you were saying that um, commenting that there should be many solutions to this. Okay, okay, I understood that. Okay, yeah. I think there is something that I don't get because I mean you said that you can fix the like the, the initial condition, say. And at, at the different condition at time, whatever, no? Yeah. Um, but then you could just think on, on the condition at this time as an initial condition of a different process, right? So you could, yeah. So, so you've got the initial state, okay? Yeah. And then you've got the end state, but, but the U is different, right? So, I mean, by applying different U's, I'll get to different places. Sure, sure. But, Sure. The thing is that say, say that I have like three times, okay, t zero, t one, t two, okay, okay. I I have my differential equation with u, so I can fix the positions at uh, t zero. Yeah. Right. This is my initial condition. With this controlling, I can fix the, the conditions at t one. Yeah. Selecting one u. Yes. Particular. But then I could then I can use this uh, t one as and a different set of initial conditions for yes. this yeah. ordinary differential equation. Yeah. So I could select also the whatever con whatever points I want for T2. Yeah, yeah. And so, so you want to do this. So I can iterate the process and get, and, 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 and get any trade one. Yes. But taking the limit to the continuous may be tricky. Yeah, it might be tricky, but 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 in let me principle, I mean if you can select okay. So there's a big catch to this that that, that I haven't mentioned yet okay so let's let's go through the, the catch it like let's go through with this th these are my notes here that about what this means and doesn't mean but it's this kind of question okay so uh so so we'll get to there um so the the um uh the first comment is that we did a single input and we could have multiple inputs so when we have multiple inputs then b is a matrix but you can go through the same argument and form this a uh, B, A, B, and so forth. So now this is not a square matrix. This is a rectangular matrix. But if it, it turns out that if it had rank N, so if it's, it's uh, 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 this will again work. So the, in some sense, it's making it easier because you have all these inputs and, and that's all the more chances to span, have the response span to space. Okay, so adding more inputs can make something easier to control. We're just asking possibilities though. Okay, so um, again, this controllability doesn't, uh, uh, imply that, and 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 we'll get to why in a moment. Um, it also, as as a corollary, would say, for example, you might not be able to hold the system at the value that you want. It doesn't guarantee. You might, but you might not. Um, and uh, another thing is that you might ask, are we, you know, are we asking too much to get to any, you know, we're asking a pretty severe definition of controllability, and so often. Or sometimes, at least, you can go with a more modest one, which is that this um, impulse response will will span perhaps a subset of your entire space. If where you want to go is in that subset, then that's okay, right? You don't necessarily have to have the system be controllable to control a particular task. Okay, this is asking for any any task that you can imagine, but it's a it's a simple test. Um, it also doesn't, again, a corollary of, of, of not specifying the path, you can cook up examples where the control trajectories are very non-local. Like you wanna go from this point to this point, and you might think that it's going to, going to do something like that, but it actually takes you around the very circuitous route. So there can be surprises like that. Okay, so, so the, to answer your question, one of the things that we have assumed is that this is a linear system. But there is one way in which all systems are not linear, and that is that all systems in practice have some limit on the range of U that is applicable. 
So you is what you do to the system. And there's always some physical limit about what you can do. Mm -hmm. So um, controllability in the way that I've defined it, because I haven't said anything about where X is and what tau is. So I can, you know, have like, um, well, I mean, kind of a hockey puck, but a, but a, anyway, you know, some 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 car or something, and I'm I'm here now, and I want to get to Jupiter in a microsecond. Okay, um, I mean, I can ask him to get, you know, from 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 here to to Belgrade in four hours or something like that, maybe. Um, but uh, but 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 controllability asks, can I get from here to Jupiter in a microsecond? And clearly, no car is going to be good enough to do that. Right, there's a maximum U that you can apply. Mm -hmm. So even systems that you sort of want to call linear have an implicit nonlinearity. And so when you get to nonlinear systems, then the then the issues, you know, the, the controllability of a linear system doesn't necessarily imply what sort of a nonlinear extension will do. Okay, and, and clearly the set will be bounded, and so you'll have to deal with some kind of reachable set that you can reach, and then that's what 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 you know within some set can you can you control it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's so that's the thing that can go wrong in the argument that you're doing that the the use that would be required to to impose at least some trajectories might be you know impractical to to put in. But you would need a crazy U, no? Well, crazy, but also like an let's say let's say that the the amplitude of U would be bounded between two values, mm -hmm. and so you would need U's that go outside those values. Okay. Um, some trajectories might be fine, but but some trajectories for sure can 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 violate that. Um, and and then the last two uh, uh, actually is that you know this this so this criterion was first formulated by a person named Kalman, an engineer named Kalman in the early 1960s, and for a long time people thought, well, this is the end of the story. I've given you a recipe. You go to your favorite programming language and you just construct, you know, actually they have routine, many of them have routines that given an A and a B will construct the right matrix, pick the look at the rank, and so on, and give you an answer. But it turns out that this is not so trivial when you start to think about large systems. So when N is very big, um, even doing this computation and figuring out the determinant can, can be non-trivial. But even more interesting, uh, for some reason, I'm not sure why, but, but it took until about 10 or 12 years ago for somebody to ask the interesting inverse question, which is, you know, given an A, can I find a B that makes the system controllable? Um, and so uh, in, in this, this, this is work that was by Barabasi and company and, and uh, in, in, in their interpretation, you can think of A as kind of a network. So every non-zero, Entry in A connects the uh, um, uh, ith, you know, the dynamics of, of, of component I with, the, the, with, with J. So you can think of the, the, the different elements of the state vectors as kind of nodes and constructing a graph that says, you know, are there, are there interactions from one node to another node? Um, and so then the question is if you have some big, so any, any network, you can construct a connection sort of matrix. Which we'll call an A and think of the dynamics on it. And so the question is, how many of those nodes or which nodes do I have to control in order to make something controllable? And you can reduce it to kind of like a binary thing with it, where the elements of A are either uh, uh, zero or non zero. But even then, you have, you know, if you have N of them, there are two to the N combinations. And so that's growing exponentially. And when N is large enough, you won't be able to answer that. Um, and so they uh, uh, use some, some tricks from graph theory to come up with a polynomial time answer to that question. And so then that's very interesting because it says that in some, you know, like if we stick with the biophysics context, um, I have some protein interaction network or something like that, and I want to know which places do I need to control in order to, to control that system, you can start to answer those questions. And so people have used it to um, kind of computationally do uh, the equivalent of knockout experiments. So there's biologists go through this painful set of experiments where they want to know, you know, what gene controls what, Well, they'll make a, an organism where they knock out a particular gene and then see does some function change. And so now, um, but what you're really doing is in a way asking about controllability for that. Like if you, if you make this certain change in the system, can you, can you control an outcome 
as desired. And so now the ability to, to sort of construct the network, which would be kind of like the A here, and then ask, you know, how do I make this a controllable system has, has real value. And so they were able to predict the results of some knockout once they did some experiments on uh, C. elegans where um, the whole brain, the, the, the neuron, neural wiring network is known. So this, the, the, the linearized version of it is, I mean, of course, it's a nonlinear dynamics, but in this case, they could show that the linearized approximation is good enough for controllability. And so they could say, you know, which neuron will control what outcome. And so that's, that's quite powerful. Um, so, so even this technical question actually has some very interesting consequences, um, not just for the little systems that we'll be focusing on, but for, for bigger systems. Okay. All right, so um, that's it on controllability, but there's a flip side, observability. And observability is asking about why the kinds of questions that we were asking before. And I'll go through this more quickly, but the, 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 the question is, we, um, in order to control the system, it, it we'll argue that we need to know, know X, but we know Y, and so given Y, can we infer X? And the important point is that we're given Y not only at some time, if, if we were just given Y at one time, it's obvious that the answer in general is no. If you have an n-dimensional state vector and you observe, you know, it's got n components and you observe y at one time, you have one value. So one value can't tell you what n values are. Mm -hmm. But if you observe y over a bunch of time in the past, then you've got as many points as you need. And so it's, it's at least possible. And so the, 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 the recipe for this, um, uh, is, is, is basically very similar. You take y equals cx, and then you, you differentiate it. So y dot is cx dot, uh, uh, which is c times ax, y double dot. And so we go on till the n minus one derivative. And, um, uh, and, and this, is a, this, is, this is again is enough because a to the n minus one is the highest independent power. And so uh, we can sort of put this in, a matrix form of n observations y related to n state components of, of x. And if this matrix here is invertible, then from the y, the n y values, we can construct the n x values. Okay. And so it's a very similar thing. And it leads to a very similar kind of condition, except that now we've got a bunch of, let's say again, one input c is a row vector. So we'll have a row vector here. CA is another row vector, CA squared is another row vector, and so on. So we have n row vectors here, and we use them to construct the matrix, and we ask, is it observable? Um, so um, uh, in, in a way, this is saying, well, um, uh, you know, so then, then, you know, intuitively what we're doing is kind of saying, well, we want to know this big Y of T, which is in terms of derivatives, but the derivatives we can always approximate in terms of finite differences. If you think about noise being in this observation, you might worry even about a first finite difference, but certainly about an n finite difference. So this is not a good way to do it in practice, but conceptually uh, uh, we, can, we can go from the derivatives to n values in the past. Okay, so, so although Y is a single component, if we had n observations in the past, those if, if this matrix is invertible, can map on to the n components of the state vector at this particular time. Okay. Um, adding u of t, okay, doesn't affect observability. Uh, uh, it just uh, uh, alters the x of t. That's that's fine. So it's just depending on c and a. Um, I'm going. I think I'm running a little late. So I'll, uh, uh, here's here's an example of a system that's unobservable. Um, so this is, um, again, two independent uh, systems. So uh, uh, x, x1 and x2 have uh, 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 different differential equations. We're only observing one component, and x1 and x2 are uncoupled. So when you observe y, it's only telling you something about x1. It's never telling you anything about x2. So it's going to fail the test. Um, and uh, uh, and 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 oh, I didn't 
I didn't compute the, okay, but when you compute this, you'll see that it's, it, it's not a invertible. Um, if we go to our friend, the harmonic oscillator, and you observe the position, we can apply the same. So here's our, here's our matrix A, here's our matrix C. CA is this row vector. And so we go C is one zero, CA is zero one. This is the identity matrix, so it's invertible. And so it says that um, this system is invertible. And you know that that's true because you can always estimate the velocity as, as um, y at this time minus y at the previous time divided by delta t. So having a sequence of y's allows us to construct the state vector. Okay, again, with noise, it's not such a great algorithm, but conceptually it works. Um, and, uh, uh, okay, let's... Okay, so I think, I, I think I'll think i skip these because these are, these are all variations. Um, and uh, let's see which one is it. So this is, this is a case where it's not observable. So X double dot is, is zero. So this is just an accelerating particle. Um, and we let Y be either X or X, X dot. Um, if we let it be um, X, then it is observable. But if we let it be X dot, then it's not because you don't know where it, where it started. Um, so again, these are sort of intuitive things. Um, if you have um, uh, different inputs going into the same system, which then get added, that's also something that's not observable because you can't, again, you can't differentiate between the two. Um, okay, so, so we've gone through somewhat slowly the, the, the story on controllability and somewhat quickly the story on observability. What you will have noticed is that they seem very similar stories. Um, notice that um, there's a so there's a kind of duality that I wanted to point out that the um, you know if we if we have the controllability matrix B A B A squared B da, 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 and then the, the the observability matrix was C C A and C A squared and so forth. Um, notice that they're the same. If we, if we let A go to A transpose and B be replaced by C transpose, um, then the matrices become the same. And so what I wanna suggest is that there's a kind of duality between uh, inputs and outputs on a system. And if we take the system and reverse the direction of time because A dagger in some sense is the same dynamics going backwards in time, um, that, and, and reverse inputs to outputs will have a, formally the same kind of dynamical system. Um, so U of T is affecting the state X of T from now into the future. Y of T is you know, influencing our estimate of the reconstruction of X of T from the past up to now, right? So um, the, 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 the whole story uh, is, um, was summarized by Shannon, the same information theory, Shannon, uh, 1959. So we can know the past, but not control it. And we can control the future, but not know it or do not do not know it. Okay, and there's a real uh, duality here. And in some cases, we'll see we'll see this as we go along even more formally that 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 formulas that apply to control also pop up for observing and they're really kind of essentially the same problem. Question? Uh, particularly in your level. Okay. Question? Sure. Yeah, is this duality a statement of the reversed time? Yeah, so 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 the 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 dual uh, uh, I mean to in order to to reconstruct a system that has the same form, you end up reversing time. Yeah. When, when you reverse inputs and outputs. Because again, the input is telling you what's gonna happen in the, in the future and the output is gonna tell you from the past what you know now. And so if you wanna reverse them, you also have to reverse the direction of time, formally. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're not, we're not really reversing the direction of time. Um, okay, so, um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, or the other thing I wanted to talk about today, um, is to introduce the notion of, of an observer, which will be 
using subsequently. And in order to do this, we're gonna we're gonna sort of ask two different kinds of questions. Um, how do we make control based on knowing the state, and how do we do it based on knowing the observations? Now, really, what we want to do is do it on observations. But let me let me kind of decompose the problem. So we imagine. I mean, you can always imagine that your C is an n by n identity matrix. And so you just know all of the components of the state vector. That's not usually the case, but it, it, there's nothing stopping it from being the case. So we'll start with that. Um, and so there's a, a theorem, which I'm not gonna prove, but I've, I've sketched out the proof here, but I'll give an example of that. You know, so here's sort of the payoff, that if A and B are controllable, then you can you can pick a matrix or a vector if it's just a, a, a k will be a row vector if it's one uh, um, one input or a, a, a matrix more generally of the form kx or minus kx um, and put the poles or the eigenvalues of the dynamics anywhere you want. So it means that you can take your dynamical system and turn it into an arbitrarily different dynamical system, which usually or hopefully will in some way be better. So, um, so, so this only and this this only applies if the system is controllable. So this is this is kind of a benefit for once you know that the system is controllable, um, what to do next. So let me let me illustrate this on a, our favorite harmonic example oscillator example. So we have x1 dot x2. Here's our oh, matrix A. I yeah. I, I didn't understand the, the, the theorem, the, what, the, what you claimed before. I mean, so the, the claim is, OK, you start with an A that uh, uh, has some set of, of it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a dynamical matrix, and the dynamics are characterized by a set of eigenvalues. Okay. OK, we're talking about linear systems. So the only things that can happen are, are like exponential decay, exponential yeah. growth, yeah. oscillations with growth and decay. Yeah. And so the set of eigenvalues will specify the dynamics, of course, with initial conditions and so forth. So now the claim is that if the system A and B is controllable, then you can define a U equals minus KX. You can define a K and construct a feedback, let U equals minus KX. Okay. In order to uh, achieve what you, whatever you want. No? Like, and so this will result in a new dynamical system whose eigenvalues are whatever you want. So you can control, you can tune up the relaxation times and the decay, no? Yeah, but you can turn an oscillator into something that relaxes. You can turn something that relaxes into an oscillator. You, you From can do it down to over down, for example. Or stable to unstable. Oh, okay. Any, anything you want, you, you can do. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see this with the harmonic oscillator. So here, here's our harmonic oscillator, and here's our, here's our B, and we checked that this is a controllable system just on the previous uh, couple of pages. And so now I wanna, I wanna let U be minus some row vector K1, K2X. Okay, so, so this is the form of the feedback. Remember, this is the feedback where we assume that we know uh, uh, the entire state vector. So it's called full state control. Not too realistic, but it's a starting point. Um, and so, um, and so, so, so then uh, uh, let's look at what BK is. Okay, because we're going to have, you know, BU is going to give us a BK. And so this is our B, this is our K. So we have a matrix here. And so if we stick this in, then the matrix, right? Let me put this in here. We have a x. Sorry, x dot is a x minus b u b. Sorry, b k x. And so there's an a minus b k matrix, which will which I'll call a prime. Sorry, I put that in eventually. Okay. So this. Oh, I did have. Sorry, I had it here. Okay. So this is this matrix here. So the new dynamics now are for a matrix a prime, which is a minus b k. And so it looks like this. If you look at its characteristic equation, you get this. And it's clear from the form of the characteristic equation that by choosing k1 and k2, I can make the roots, the, 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 the eigenvalues lambda, anything I want, uh, or s, sorry. OK, so, so, so this is a, a kind of 
simple example where we see that this full control is, is possible. And on the previous page, there's a proof that, that for a general A and B, that this is at least a sketch of a proof that it's possible. Okay, so so that's nice. And so um, then one question is like, okay, what would you, you know, where would you want to put the poles? And of course, it depends on what you want to do, but there are some at least heuristic guidelines. Um, so for example, let's let's think about this harmonic oscillator. Maybe we have a harmonic oscillator and we're interested in vibration damping. So vibration damping, you know, the system gets hit and you want it to go back to its equilibrium as fast as possible. And you may remember from, from intermediate mechanics that uh, the, 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 the way to do this with a second order system is to be a critical damping, right? Like if it's very little damping, it will oscillate a lot. And if it's very much over damped, there's a fast mode, but then there's a slow mode that gets slower and slower to relax. So critical damping is the minimum relaxation, you know, minimum time to uh, uh, relax. So that seems like a reasonable place to shoot for um, so let's say we want to put our poles at minus two, minus two. Okay, we could just solve for the values of K1 and K2 that, that make this possible. Um, one thing to note is that um, let's say we wanted to put this at minus A and A because you know, I took two kind of arbitrarily, but the bigger the value is, right, minus A and, and, and minus A, the bigger A is, the faster it would relax. And naively, wouldn't you want a you know, vibration? damping thing to relax as quickly as possible. The problem is the one we talked about last time, which is that if you look at the values of K that you need in order to do this, they grow with A. And if you have any other dynamics that we haven't talked about that have delays or things that are like delays, then we showed that putting very high gains will lead to instabilities, okay? so. You could, in principle, put your pole arbitrary, you know, in arbitrary position, but in reality, since the dynamics that you're actually controlling are never going to be exactly what you assume here, they're never going to be this simple. You'll always have some kind of delay coming from from uh, uh, some part of the system that there'll be a practical limit to what you can do. Of course, the other limit is that the bigger the the, the gains, the bigger the values of u that are required. You know, for, for, for a given perturbation, the U is KX. So if the K is the growing with A, then the bigger the value of U and you'll have a finite range of U. And so all of these considerations mean that you shouldn't just arbitrarily create some very short relaxation time. Um, and in general, the heuristic would be, you know, to, to um, keep the gains as small as possible, but still fast enough for your purposes, like don't get greedy and make it try to make it faster. Um, now, this is a two-dimensional system. We have two gains. Once you get to an n-dimensional system, you have n gains. That's a lot of choice. And so again, we want some systematic ways of thinking about it. Um, we'll do that tomorrow. But uh, for the moment, um, the uh, heuristic rule of thumb would be of the poles. You know, only try to do something to the poles that are annoying, you know, that are bad for you in some sense, and then just leave the other. You know, the, the fewer you change, the less effort it requires. And so, you know, you try to identify. It's typically the the the, the more slowly damped uh, ones with the fastest dynamics. So, if you have a set of poles here, um, these ones will be kind of what are called the dominant poles because. There, in some sense, at long times, there's what's left after things have decayed here. And so these ones you might want to move and then have other ones become the dominant. And to, you know, you move these around so that, that they and other ones become, become the dominant poles. And um, you know, try to do as little as you can get away with is the, is the general heuristic. But it would be nice to formalize that and we'll do that tomorrow. Um, and so uh, but this is sort of a, a, a lead up into the uh, question that I really wanted to talk about, which is, um, you know, we've, we've assumed that we have an output that equals the state vector, that we were able to observe all n components of the state vector. But as I've, as I've argued, that's not the, the case. And we've argued that it's possible if the system is observable, then it is possible to, to accumulate enough information to reconstruct the system but you know you can sort of see that if 
it, it might take so long to get that information that, you know, in some sense, the system is, you know, not doing what you want while you're get, get, figuring out what the state is, right? You have to be able to, to get that from past observations quickly enough in order to have a state that, that's useful. Um, okay. So, um, so, so the interesting thing is that there's kind of a, a, a technique for dealing with this situation that people came from control theory, which turns out to be optimal in lots of cases. It's, it's reasonable in, in almost all cases, but it's optimal in, 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 in many of them. And it's to introduce the notion of an, observ of, of an observer. So an observer is going to be kind of a shadow dynamical system that lives on a computer, okay, um, which is going to be a computer model of the dynamics that you're trying to control. So the rough idea is that you've got the real dynamics in the real world, and then you've got a copy of the real dynamics on your computer, and you're gonna to try to set up some interaction that synchronizes them, okay, using the observations, feed it into your model and synchronize the two systems. Once the systems are synchronized, then you have the, 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 the state vector because you know internally in your computer model what the state vector is, right? You've got the whole model running on your computer. So if you can synchronize their behavior, then, uh, uh, then, then you're good. And the intuitive way to synchronize them is to use as a kind of, is to use feedback with an error that is the difference between the predicted output from your model and the observed output that, that, that you're measuring. Okay, so let's, let's see how this can, can work. So let me do this naively. So a naive observer doesn't have that feedback and let's just see what can go wrong. So here is the physical system. So it's our linear system. Here is a dynamical model. Now we know the input, so we can feed the same input U into both the real system and the model. Um, now, if we do this, let's look at the difference in the state vectors. So let x be x minus x. So x hat, I'll, I'll use hats for this shadow dynamical system, okay, which is where the x hat is supposed to be kind of like an estimator of, 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 of x, although we don't have any stochastic part yet. Um, and then e is the difference. And so if we subtract it, notice that this part just cancels out, same input to both. And so we're left with E dot equals AE. Now, if A is stable, uh, a system if the dynamics are stable, this will, the error will eventually go to zero. So that sounds good. But we can immediately see that if there's gonna be a problem if A is an unstable system, okay? So remember, U might be a stabilizing, it's an unstable system that might be controlled by U to be stabilized. Um, and we've just seen that if A and B are controllable, we can, make the eigenvalues whatever we want. And, and one of the big uses for this is that if you have an unstable system, you can, you can replace the eigenvalue, the unstable eigenvalues and move them over into the stable part of the, 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 the uh, plane, complex plane. Um, so we can stabilize a dynamical system. So, so A can be unstable, but the controlled system is, is stable, but, in the, but, but, but this part cancels out and so the difference is just obeying the original dynamics which are unstable, which means that the errors diverge exponentially. The difference uh, diverges exponentially. So clearly this strategy of an observer won't work uh, if um, the dynamics are unstable, but it turns out that it actually doesn't work very well, even if they're stable because um, the A tells you the time scale like the, the smallest eigenvalue of A will tell you the longest relaxation time, set the time that it takes to synchronize. And the observer here, this, this system is called the observer system in, their jar, in the control theory jargon. It takes an identical amount of time to relax as the physical dynamic. But intuitively, if you really want to control it well, you should know the state in a time that is shorter than the time of the dynamics. So what do we do? Um, we add feedback based on the observation we said. So the observer has the original dynamics, and then we add in something that's proportional to the difference between the observations and the predictions. So the predictions are, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I have an x hat, then cx hat would be the y that I predict. So y minus cx hat is, is the, the predicted value. 
And so now if I, if I formulate these aerodynamics, then I've got an A minus LC. And so the, the observer aerodynamics now are, based, are, are um, looking at a, a, a modified dynamics, A prime is A minus LC. And L is a, is, is a um, for a single observer, observable, L would be a, uh, um, a column vector of um, gains. And so uh, we, we ha again have N kind of observer gains to tune to make the eigenvalues of, of A prime, whatever we like. So now we can, in principle, uh, make it as fast as we, you know, this, this, this convergence of the observer as fast as we like. In practice, again, I'm leaving out part of the story. Um, when you add noise, if you try to make it too fast, then you get into problems. Um, essentially, like the kind of finite difference in things that we're talking about, that, that you need some time to average over noise. So if you, if you make the time scale for this observer to be too short, it'll be uh, uh, bad from a noise point of view. But we don't have any noise yet. So formally, it looks like we can do whatever we want. Um, okay, so again, back to the harmonic oscillator. Um, you know, how does this work? Well, okay, so here's here's our, our dynamics matrix. Here's our output matrix. And so now we, we have L as a column vector. And we form LC, and so we form this A prime minus LC. And so we get a, 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 a kind of modified dynamics for the observer errors. And so again, we can choose L1 and L2 to put the poles wherever we want. So we can put them at you know, minus two, minus, if we put them at minus two, minus two, then L would be four, three. Um, again, one would find that you need bigger observer gains to get faster observer uh, relaxations um, and noise will eventually limit what you, you're allowed to, uh, or what's reasonable to do. Um, but what would happen is, is kind of what I've sketched here, that you would have, uh, the, the, the physical system would be there here. The um, observer systems, you know, you don't know what the initial state is. So you have to, you have to initialize it with an arbitrary initial condition. And so whatever you pick though, it will, it will synchronize and eventually the two systems will go in lockstep. So you create this uh, uh, synchronized system and then the state vector is the same for both. Um, and then, uh, uh, then you can use that state vector as an input into the control. Um, it's interesting to look at the structure of the full dynamics. So, okay, well here I've added a reference, but but you know here we have um, the the x and x hat. This is the observer uh, feedback. If we look at the error, um, all of the inputs and so forth uh, uh, um, are, are are zero. But if we write this. As a, as a coupled dynamical system of the, the true dynamics X and the observer error E, then notice that, that this matrix here um, has sort of these block components here. And so the, the eigenvalues uh, 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 are just given by the eigenvalues of this and the eigenvalues of, of here. And this leads to a separation principle, which is that we can have this observer in the system lead to a, a reconstructed state x hat. And then because the original system dynamics were not changed, we can use it as if we had a full state. So remember I said, wouldn't it be great if we could observe the full state because then if it's controllable, we can put the eigenvalues in anywhere we want. What this shows is that if we reconstruct things with an observer, we can still do that using the observer x hat instead of the, 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 the state as a substitute. So this is called the separation principle. Um, it's something that is, true for linear systems and may or may not be true for nonlinear systems. So it's in general true when things are controllable and observable, then you can do this. Um, it's more subtle for uh, nonlinear systems. I think I'm gonna still get a couple of, so still, still get a couple of quick things here. Um, so um, uh, so you, can, you can use this either kind of in hardware and software. So in hardware, you have your really have your physical system and you would, you would have the observer on your computer and you would use the observations of the physical system as inputs to the observer. And then the observer would, would synchronize and anything you want to add control once it's synchronized, then you're able to use the, the X hats as a basis for control. So you have the Y's that give you the X hats 
And then the exats give you the control of the use. So you kind of decompose your control problem into these two separate steps. Um, you can do everything on a computer too, if you're just sort of simulating a, a system. And so then that's what I've sketched here. Um, and um, again, the, the, the upshot is that um, uh, if, if, if you, know, you, you, you want to keep your observer dynamics faster, you want to observe the system faster than the natural system dynamics, and then you can control it in a reasonable way. Um, uh, and so the last thing, and I think I'll, we were kind of running a uh, long stuff and have talked about a lot of things, is just an application of this. So you, you have a disturbance. Um, uh, so, so there's there's the input that you want, but sometimes the system is also subject to other inputs that you don't want. So environmental perturbations, somebody kicks the table or whatever. Um, so those will enter the system through another input. So in some sense, all systems really are multiple inputs because they're the inputs that you want, but then they're the inputs that you don't want to. Those, those are formally another kind of input. Um, and so, um, uh, so, 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 so I go through and, and using these techniques, what you can do is um, basically construct an estimator, not only for the state, but if we think of the disturbances as being um, generated, so the, the, the class of signals that are entering is being generated by another kind of dynamical system. So um, you could have white noise inputs, but often you've got something that has some defined characteristics. So it might be a sinusoidal, you know, if you're thinking about vibrations from the earth, it might be you know, signs of different frequencies and so forth. Um, so if we think about uh, um, the, the disturbances of being generated by their own dynamical system, we can try to estimate their state. And then if we know their state, then we can try to have a control that would get rid of them. And so I go through that and, and um, the, the interesting result that comes from that, which is getting a little tangential to my main purpose, so that's why I'm not going through it so much, is that it's something called the internal model principle, which is that if you want to correct for, you know, exactly asymptotically for some kind of disturbance, your controller needs to know about the dynamics that generate that disturbance. So if you have, for example, sinusoidal disturbances, your controller has to know that your disturbances are generated by a harmonic oscillator equation. And so if you do that, then you can design a control that, that after some transient will perfectly compensate for, let's say, being you know, vibrated at some frequency. Um, so that's nice, but it requires you to know something about the kinds of disturbances that you might encounter. So if you do, you can take advantage of it to design a controller that will exactly remove that kind of disturbance. So again, this is something that, you know, if you're designing LIGO or something and you want to isolate it from all the vibrations of the earth, then these kinds of techniques are, are useful. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's the internal model principle. It's just, just what I was saying. Okay, so I'm, out of steam, and I suspect you guys are. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I want to talk about today. Are there, are there questions about the uh, uh, the observers and stuff? So the the thing that will eventually carry forward is is this technique of using an observer to help estimate a state. Um, but what we will eventually need to do is um, uh, add in noise to this story, which we haven't done yet. Okay. Any questions? Questions are from the. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Yeah, not totally related to today's lecture, but more, very more general question about relating control theory to biological systems and stochastic models and biology. So, I think in your, in your lecture that there are these very nice models where there is a convolution and you go to a Laplace phase and everything is quite easy to manage. So, yeah, and I wonder if in biophysics. I am not aware of um, whether there are models were controlled with convolutions and whether they make sense. Uh, the I mean, people have done some limited use. There's, there's, there's a very nice paper um, by Boris Schreiman um, and others from a long, like 20 years ago that, that sort of tried to argue like in, in signal chains and stuff that you could use some of the same concepts. Um, but yeah, more generally, you want to. You, I mean, these these concepts have to be generalized to kind of more complicated dynamics or 
<laughs> we're getting trying to get there at least some some of the way there. And one more that they used and uses the air bundle dynamics. So it's one by it, it what the air cell bundle dynamics and they can explain later. But, uh, where you model the, the one position variable which you mentioned experimental. There's another position variable for motors that do adaptation to this um, motion of the bundle. And then there's a third variable which is the calcium concentration in the cell. Which is um, supposed to be um, the feedback in the most of the model. And this is the production dynamics, like mm -hmm. yesterday. But I've never seen this type of approach with convolution, but it's really, in principle, makes sense no? that variables do not respond instantaneously. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean, it might not be convolution if it's a nonlinear connections and stuff. Uh, I mean, I should say that one obvious, you know, generalization of the observer. Uh, in in nonlinear cases, is you know this idea of creating a copy of your dynamical system, and then trying to couple it with the observations, you know, in principle can work for nonlinear dynamics as well as as linear dynamics. So you know, I just said you know take a copy of the system and have you know have them go in parallel. So you can take a, a nonlinear copy, I mean a copy of a nonlinear system, and do the same thing. And and in fact, if they're fairly close. If they're close enough, then you can linearize the difference of the dynamic. I mean, we, we, we've been looking at the difference, and that would obey linearize a linear equation if they're close enough. The problem that's a little subtle is that you don't know the initial condition. So, you know, after a while, I mean, they, they, you know, this might work if they were close enough, but if they started out, you know, with an initial condition for the copy, the observer that is too different from the actual state of the system. There's no guarantee that that you know being too, you know, the being being so far apart that they would necessarily uh, uh, synchronize based on a linear strategy. You, you know, knowing the structure of the nonlinear equations, you might try for a more fancy nonlinear control that would always stabilize them. But that's okay, then that's extra work to do. But 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 you can sort of see that at least in nice nonlinear situations um, this same strategy would work um, the the other comment which will come back later on is that what we're really doing here is making use of prior knowledge so so implicit in all of this is that I know the dynamics of the system I'm trying to control okay and so I, I use that knowledge to come up with another you know this shadow dynamical system the observer, um, but in order to do that, I had to know the original dynamics, including all the parameter values. So when we talk, start talking about Bayesian inference and, and, and priors, this is kind of the way to incorporate prior knowledge of the dynamics into, into inferences. So again, I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but this may be for Edgar's <laughs> benefit. Sorry to go back to it, but I just didn't quite get the, the argument with the fact that you could get the control of the constant, or not constant, but the uh, equal uh, view back when you were. The example where you could make the uh, the, the protocols cross. Mm -hmm. um, now I try to find the uh, exact way to find it, but um, it's just that if you have a couple, if you have a couple, one order differential equation or these or the partial couple differential equations, then isn't the system already overdetermined? Like, sorry, sorry. like um, you have the set of couple differential equations with x dot equal to um, this equation well, because yeah. you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so here, I mean, the amount is set. That the smooth set and also the initial prediction set. Mm -hmm. um, so I would think mm -hmm. that x1 and x2 would end up depending on each other, right? Like they, you could express, you could solve the system and then you could express one coordinate as a function of the other, right? Uh, given, given you, given you. Given you, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the question is can I choose you to sort so of that, yeah, make, so them, make them independent? And, and, and the answer here is yes. But it, it, at this specific situation, then, right? Uh, meaning. Well, right. So it's only yeah. holding it to 
I mean, the, the, the controllability is asking about the state of the system at one particular time with all the freedom of choosing U at all the intermediate time values. So yeah. there's there's many, many values of U talking about. So it's it's very, very overdetermined. Like I've got a lot of freedom on U to tune these two values. Um, so it's also very specific when you said like three. Uh, yeah, well, that's why the controllability test depends on the specific A and B. Right. Okay. Yeah, so it's sort of given the lambdas, given the, the, the one and the one, is it controllable? Okay. You, you, you might change the, the, the B, this one, one, to something else and make it non controllable. I mean, we, we know how that works now from, from here. I mean, we would just redo this calculation with, with you know, B1 and B2 here. And just see when is this invertible or not. There's probably some combination of these that make it not controllable, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. When we solve a uh, equation of motion, uh, we need to specify the the either initial and or the final boundary condition. Yes. And this be viewed as a special subset of uh, control and observability issue that you you choose u and y at the uh, initial time and final time well okay so so the the the, the um where's the picture that i had it with the observer yeah so so um you know if we look at this picture here um I mean, the, the, the idea with this observer, for example, is to create dynamics that will, where the difference is going to zero at some uh, controllable prescribed rate. And so it doesn't matter what initial condition you, you give your observer, right? It, it will always decay. The difference will always be decaying away. Yeah, but you can give like uh, just the delta function in each, the the u function, right? Okay, sorry. This, time. This, sorry, this is this is observability. But um, so your 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 question is about controlling it or observing it. Sorry, I'm a little confused. Uh, both. I mean, the the controlling is for the initial condition. U is delta function, and uh, observability I had in mind like final boundary. I specify where I want to end up. Okay, but observability has nothing to do with the control. So the the the, the inputs that you apply are irrelevant because I understand. This, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The, the 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 same input is being applied. The input is known, so it's being applied to both the physical model, physical system, and the computer model. Um, and so and and then here you're setting it up so that the initial condition for the observer doesn't matter. So you, I'm not sure I. I'm getting where you're going with that. Well, the, the, when, when we solve the, the, the equation of motion, I can specify initial uh, position and the final position, right? And I look for the path. For, for controllable system, yeah. And so there'll be some view that will give you a desired from take you from a from a known initial condition to a desired final condition. Yeah. Right. So the in the when we solve the equation of motion, the same thing. So instead of the initial position, initial velocity, I can choose initial position and final position arbitrarily, right? If it's controlled, yeah. Yeah. No, no, without control. I mean that's I mean the, the conventional, you know, the just the mechanics, the exercise, right? But I mean, it won't. I mean, you can't if you don't. If you, if you don't have a control, then 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 the final position won't be what you specify, right? In general. Well, I mean, there would be non yeah no solution. But uh, for the to usual dynamical you know trajectories, I can choose. Uh, I can specify initial and final position instead of initial position and initial velocity, right? Well, okay, yeah, yeah. We're sorry. Yes, if you specify an initial position, if if it's like a two dimensional state vector. You could specify an initial position and velocity, or you could say, I want an initial position and a final position, and there'll be some velocity that makes that work. Yeah, that's true. Right. So I was just wondering whether that can be viewed as a you know very simple 
control setup. In other words, init the initial condition can be viewed as controlling and observing the system. Well, again, observing is 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 a separate story. Um, it doesn't say anything about observing, right? So, in the sense that in the sense that I end up particular position. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that you know what that what the state is, right? So, observing is just saying, you know, can I figure out what the the, the full and dimensional state of the system is? Um, you know, in, in the extreme case, you have no observation. So it's obviously not observable. C is just a zero matrix or zero vector. Um, so you can still do everything you were saying, but you have no idea. Like the system is doing kind of what you want, but you have no idea that it's doing it or not, right? That's a separate question, right? One is, what is the state of the system? And the other is, do you know what the state of the system is? I see. So your answer, your short sure answer is that the, the, this initial condition, either initial or final position, is not the complete observations. It has nothing to do with observation. So again, just think of the case where you're blindfolded, you have no information about the system. The system can be going, can be doing what you say, but you have no idea if that's true or not. Right, that's what I meant. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah so these are really separate, uh, separate issues, um, but, and we'll come back to this uh, tomorrow and Thursday, this, this duality means that there's a certain kind of similarity to our discussion about, um, you know, can we control something and can we observe it? And mathematically, they have some common features, but, but they're independent uh, in terms of what an actual system is like. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Or in, in tomorrow will do some optimal control and and uh, uh, yeah talk about how to implement some of these controls in a more sy systematic way. John's lectures are available online from yesterday. Uh, you can find them in the website. And today we will try to be a bit quicker. Okay, and I'll, I'll send them so we can get them.